Hello and welcome to the Dorkomotive Podcast with Brian Loans. On this episode, we're going to talk about how Abe Lincoln was America's first gearhead president. He was the only president to hold a patent, and we'll talk about how his work as a lawyer helped to create the modern mechanical world that we live in today. That's right, Honest Abe was a gearhead. This episode of the Dorkomotive Podcast is being presented by NitroActive.net. NitroActive.net carries the best in nostalgia West Coast drag strip t-shirts as well as hot rod and car culture t-shirts from places like Moon Eyes, Laid Back, Lucky 13, SoCal Speed Shop, Hollywood Hot Rods, and more. They also have a massive inventory of vintage collectible hot rod, car craft, hop-up, popular hot rodding, drag racing, super stock, and drag illustrated magazines, as well as classic and vintage photos. Visit NitroActive.net for all your vintage hot rod and drag racing needs. Use promo code DORK and check out and save 10% on your next purchase at NitroActive.net. It seems an impossible thing to talk about, let alone an impossible thing to be a gearhead, in the 1800s, especially in the first half of the 1800s. But that's exactly what this episode's going to be about, and it's going to be about a very specific person, someone who would become an immortal in the history of America, someone who is still considered perhaps the greatest president we have ever had, and a guy who many people don't know was obsessed with machines and technology, Abe Lincoln is that guy. Abe Lincoln is the only president to ever have a patent in his own name, and it was for a device he envisioned to be used to lift riverboats over sandbars in the Mississippi River and wherever else they were sailing. We will get to that in a little while here, but we have to set that whole story up and talk about how Abe Lincoln could possibly have been a gearhead and what his motivations were in that realm of thought. And what we know about Abe Lincoln, what most people know from their history books, is that as a kid, he grew up in Kentucky. His dad was a kind of a farmer, carpenter, do-what-it-takes-to-survive type of guy. And it meant that Abe Lincoln's early life was filled with a whole lot of manual labor. We always see the, the images of him with an axe splitting logs and doing other work like that. And it's always reported that he kind of hated doing all that type of heavy-duty mechanical hard work or that that manual labor. And it's why, for many reasons, people thought that he read a lot. He would read to escape this uh, this stuff that he hated to do. And, you know, the old stories were that he was got in trouble because he was always reading when he was supposed to be, you know, running a plow or doing some other work and that uh, he did not want to do. So it is from those early days of Abe Lincoln um, not really liking the fact that he was having to bust his backside every day to keep his family, you know, supported in line that he would form this uh, fascination, especially with farm equipment. And we have to talk about at the time, you know, threshing machines and the mechanization of farming in America was starting in its very earliest phases to take shape. This was not yet when we had tractors, but... You had horses that could draw implements, and those implements would be mechanized, whether we're talking about a thresher, um, whether we're talking about some of the other uh, very basic early mechanical farming aids. Lincoln loved this stuff, and he would become kind of surrounded by it during his early life. About the 1836 time frame, Lincoln becomes a circuit lawyer, which means he spends a couple of months a year traveling a a fairly vast uh, area of real estate, in Illinois, arguing cases, and these were typically small town cases that he would argue, whether we're talking about, you know, people being slandered or people stealing pigs or, you know, just the typical kind of small town lawyer stuff. And this is where he really kind of uh, earned his chops as a lawyer, learned the legal system from the ground up. Um, He was self-taught, you know, he borrowed books from a guy, studied for years and then got his law license on his own. Um, he was not a classically trained East Coast lawyer, the type of which we'll be talking him about him dealing with in just a few minutes. But this is one of the reasons that Lincoln was able to continue his fascination with farm equipment and with machines in general, because in this 1830s time frame, as he's on the circuit court, he's traveling and he's staying with the people he's he's representing a lot of times. So he's like rooming at people's houses. And of course, this is a frontier style place. Illinois in the 1830s was, was almost the bleeding edge of the Western United States. So this was a pretty rural place. It was very agrarian. Um, and when he would stay at these farms, he would be like, hey, you know, what do you guys got for equipment down there in the shed? And anybody that had anything, he would go and stare at it and learn how it worked and touch it and move it and see the gears and see the mechanisms. And he loved it. And as we'll come to find out through his life, Lincoln would champion technology. He would champion the right for people to have technology. He would champion the protection, if you will, of technological advancement. And he would be the only president to ever hold a patent. So his law career is continuing to blossom and grow. Uh, He is learning the ropes, if you will. And again, he's learning the ropes 
in a way that people don't learn law anymore. You don't you no longer learn law by just traveling around trying cases and figuring out what works and what doesn't. You know, you go to the university, you study for years, you go to law school. It's a whole process, which on the East Coast, pretty much everybody was following. But in this part of the world, that wasn't the way it worked. And as we'll find out in the 1850s, this would actually come to both help and hamper Abraham Lincoln. One of the things Lincoln would travel on a lot, as most people did in this area, in this history of time, were steamboats and riverboats. And riverboats would occasionally run into shallows on the rivers that were constantly fluctuating in their depth, and they would get stuck. And the, when the riverboats got stuck, there was very few easy ways to get it unstuck. You know, these are flat bottom boats, so they didn't have a V-shaped hull underneath them, but they would run aground every once in a while. And basically the idea and the way they were freed was a couple of different methods, if you will. They would chuck anything that was not bolted down, whether we're talking about, you know, liquor casks and wood and anything like that, they would throw all that stuff off the side. Most of the crew would jump off the ship as well, and they would be trying to free this thing up. But they would also take those barrels, any empty barrels they have, would seal them, and they would force them underneath the boat in different areas to try to get it a little bit more buoyant, and then they could free it up and push it over the berm. He had seen this happen many times, and it had cost him, as well as many other travelers, a load of time in the process. So as Lincoln's traveling, and as he's growing up, and as he's continuing to this kind of understand the mechanical world around him, he devises an idea that he will turn into a patent, and he thinks he has solved this problem for good. And it takes about 10 years for him to really flush it out, but we go from this late 1830s time frame of him being a lawyer, traveling a lot, and dealing with these problems, we fast forward to the mid-1840s, and now we talk about Abraham Lincoln, the inventor, and how he was going to help riverboats never get stuck on a sandbar again. So over his uh, time span, over watching people try to free up stuck riverboats, um, he, on May 22nd, 1849, was granted a patent for a device that was designed for, quote-unquote, buoying vessels over shoals. And he invented this thing and did all the paperwork kind of between terms as an Illinois congressman during the 1848-1849 time frame. And he had a model. He created a model. Uh, the model still exists. You can actually see it. It's in the Smithsonian. And um, some people claim that he whittled most of the model. Other people claim that he hired model builders to do some of the work for him. But undoubtedly, he handled this model that you can actually go watch. So what he came up with here was a very basic idea. And it was kind of a massive version of um, a massive version of what he had seen the crews on ships do with those barrels I was telling you about. Rather than forcing casks or, you know, hollow, buoyant barrels underneath a riverboat to try to get it to float over something, he was proposing that each side of the riverboat be equipped with these big, long, accordion-looking bellows. So we're talking about a device that kind of looks like a crumpled up... Um, it kind of looks like a crumpled up accordion. That's really the only way to say it. And if you can imagine, it would have these giant poles that went straight up. So these things are probably 20, 30 feet long. They would have these poles that would guide them straight up and down. And there was two of them on either side of the boat. So the idea was if the boat gets stuck, the crew would crank these things down. They would inflate them using an air pump. And these particular floating buoyant uh, vessels, the buoyant bellows, if you will, would just lift the hull of the ship up enough to get it over whatever object it was stuck on. So you weren't trying to lift the ship out of the water or the vessel out of the water. You were simply trying to lift it up just a couple inches to get the thing to float over whatever it was stuck on. Sandbar, shoals, whatever. There are some very inherent problems to this particular device in the fact that one, it takes a lot, it, it would take multiple men to shove a single cask into the water. It takes that much uh, weight to overcome the buoyancy of a cask let alone the buoyancy of a effectively a giant balloon, a giant bladder that was filled up that's 20-some feet long. The way that you would actually force this into the, the water itself was one of the big sticking points. And modern engineers have looked at this thing, and, and no one's really disproven it, the fact that it would work at all. Like, you'd probably be able to make this or some variant of it work at some point. But in the 1849 timeframe, when it was patented, 
what would likely have ended up happening is you would take these uh, you take these bellows and try to put them in the water, and they would just float, and the boat wouldn't move, and then you'd have probably an even bigger problem because <laughs> now you've expended all this extra manpower to try to move the thing. So it is a great idea in theory. It, it is a certainly a simple a simple solution to a fairly complicated problem, which I think is the the essence of being kind of the gearhead thinker is you're just looking for the easiest way to solve an existing problem. And this would have done it had this worked. No one's ever put the model in the water. God forbid no one will do it now because the thing is a national treasure. But he was awarded the patent. Whether it was going to be functional or not, he was the first guy to come up with a design of this type for this particular application. And so he was given patent number 6000. 469, as I mentioned, on May 22nd, 1849. So you think that's the end of the story, right? Yeah, he invented a thing. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't, but he had a patent. Only president to have a patent in his name. That's the end of the story. It's actually really the beginning of the story for Abe Lincoln and his mechanical fixation in the world. Because during this time when he's in Congress, his stature is growing. He is, again continuing to practice law when he's not serving in this congressional seat. He is at home practicing law. He is practicing law at a higher level now. Still kind of a folksy dude, West Coast, or at the time, a Western Frontier-style lawyer. Didn't have the polish. Ungangly guy. Of course, we're talking about a man who was way over six feet tall in an era when most people were not even close to being six feet tall. So he was definitely physically a strange presence around people and his mannerisms by most accounts were kind of strange. He could be taciturn. He could be, um, kind of, uh, how should we say quiet at times when he, maybe people expected him to be a little bit more outgoing. So he, he did strike people on occasion the wrong way. As it would turn out, these particular personality traits would become invaluable to him as the president during one of the most tumultuous times in history. But on a localized, person-to-person basis, Abe Lincoln was not seen as the most normal guy around. Everyone knew he was smart. Everyone knew he was a pretty good lawyer. But everyone also knew that the guy was a little bit off in terms of when it came to dealing with person-to-person stuff. We fast forward from 1849, when he has successfully been awarded his patent, and we go to 1855 now. And in 1855, Lincoln is involved in a very strange way in a very cool patent law case involving two guys, one guy named Cyrus McCormick and one guy named John Manny. As many of you know out there, Cyrus McCormick, a very huge figure in the history of agriculture in America, he was the guy that invented the mechanical threshing machine that allowed a ton more work to be done in a day than was ever thought possible. Now, this threshing machine was dragged by horses, of course, or oxen or whatever draft animal you wanted to hook to it. But it was still a machine that did the job of multiple people at a speed that was just incalculable at this time in history. But like anything, you can always improve on a design. And a guy named John Manny had studied Cyrus McCormick's machine and decided that he could make a better mechanical reaping machine. McCormick, a very wealthy man, having sold his machines for years, all of a sudden finds out that John Manny's machine has come out and it's being given awards at exhibitions and it's being recognized by you know farming publications and the authorities of the industry that this thing is the best uh, this is the best threshing machine going man this guy really did a great job and Cyrus McCormick did what people do even today in 2020 when they feel as though their particular patent has been infringed upon they lawyer up so Cyrus McCormick gets a legal team that is comprised of some of the most famous high dollar Big deal, big baller, shot collar lawyers in America, and Abraham Lincoln. And this is the next part of Abraham Lincoln's mechanical story, and it's probably the weirdest, yet the most entertaining one of all. So the McCormick Manny case is where Abe Lincoln is both uh, kind of a hero and also kind of the sad, um, kind of the sad story of this case as well. So when the case is formed up, when the case is filed, it is going to be tried in Illinois. So Abe Lincoln's reputation in Congress and as a lawyer in Illinois was very strong. So the legal team of McCormick decided to hire him because they felt as though Lincoln would be able to influence a judge in this part of the world. They felt as though his homey um, Midwestern, at that point, Western style would fit exactly in with the audience and they'd probably be able to influence the judge. So he was given and promised the ability to make the closing argument in the case which was going to be a big deal. So Lincoln, 
throws himself at this thing and gives everything he has to this case. He is studying, he is creating arguments, he is doing what I guess every good lawyer does, building his particular his particular case. And he starts to notice some problems with the law firm that he is working with as a hired lawyer because they won't send him anything. He's asking for paperwork and he's asking for some of the briefs and some of the depositions and some of the interviews that have been done previous to the trial and they won't send him anything. And the other lawyers that he's going to be working with are this guy named Pete Watson, or Peter Watson, George Harding, and a guy named Edwin Stanton, who would become another major figure in American history because of Lincoln. So the big problem here is they transferred the trial from Illinois to Cincinnati, Ohio. Once they did that, Lincoln was really of no use to these guys, at least they thought, because now they are said, well, we don't need them because we don't have the local influence problem anymore. We're kind of on neutral ground here. They never even told him that the trial had been moved. They kind of figured they had gotten rid of the bumpkin town city lawyer that they no longer needed and were kind of perhaps even embarrassed to uh, have along on their very uppity, if you will, high-class team. So... Lincoln f- finds out what's going on. He just shows up. So Lincoln just goes down to Cincinnati like, hey, guys, uh, you forgot to tell me this was happening. And they were kind of shocked to see him. And they basically said, go home. Um, Stanton was very rude to Lincoln, um, talked about how poorly he was dressed and how poorly and how just kind of scra- scraggly the guy looked coming out of the woods of Illinois. Um, basically, to the point of when Lincoln went back and talked to, uh, you know, his friends and confidants at home, he talked about how roughly, quote unquote, he had been treated by Edwin Stanton. So very quickly, they tell Lincoln, hey, man, like you're not allowed to do anything here. So go home. And Lincoln said, well, at least let me watch the case. They wouldn't let him speak. They wouldn't let him even kind of be recognized as part of their legal team. But they did allow him to stay in the courtroom. So Lincoln observes the entire trial. They wouldn't even eat with him. They would go out to lunch and stuff, and they would they would leave him. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing that they just uh, they treated Lincoln like a like a jerk, and um, well, we know how that turned out later. Anyway, Lincoln was angry by the experience, but he was also very enlightened by the experience because when he sat there and watched this trial and saw how brilliant a lawyer Stanton was, how brilliant a lawyer Stanton's uh, compatriots in this Watson and Harding were. He went back and thought, yes, these guys are jerks and they treated me poorly, but whoa, I have a lot to learn. So Lincoln, again, kind of intensifies his studying in the realm of being a lawyer and in the law itself and how to argue cases because what he watched in that courtroom let him know that he was not in the league of these guys yet. He wasn't relieved that he didn't get his chance because he did feel as though his arguments were compelling and good, but he knew that when he spoke, if he had spoken, after they had seen the brilliance of these other men and the articulate nature of these other men that he was going to definitely come off like someone who might not have belonged with that particular group. They win the case, by the way. Manny Manny's side wins. He does not have to pay any major damages, and Manny um, continues on a successful and prosperous life. So with this experience behind him, we have another example of Lincoln being the gearhead, Lincoln always looking forward to the next thing, championing the next thing. He defended railroads a ton during this time. Railroads became one of his major clients, and he also spent a lot of time, as he grew his skills, arguing cases in front of the Illinois Supreme Court. He argued uh, more than a dozen cases, almost 20 cases in front of the Illinois Supreme Court, and the majority of them were involved in transportation issues. It would be a little more than a year or two after the McCormick-Manning case that Lincoln would have perhaps his most shining moment in a courtroom. And once again, it would be a mechanically based gearhead style argument that he would be having to make in front of this court. And the implications of this particular case would be felt through American history. The case was very simply that of a riverboat company suing a company that built a railroad bridge that went over the Mississippi River in Rock Island, Illinois. So this was um, a, a huge trial because it was going to determine whether or not people, railroads, had the right to build bridges over the Mississippi River, which may cause river boats to have to navigate through them. And the technology at this time didn't exist to make these spans that didn't have their, you know, that didn't have support columns going into the ground or going into the water. So what this meant was the bridges would have to be, in some ways, obstructing the river, but they would have to allow for commerce and things to happen around them. 
the riverboat companies were extremely fearful that if this was allowed to be a trend, they were going to be put out of business because the railroads moving east to west and north to south were far more efficient, were far faster, were far better at every single thing than the riverboats were, which primarily did north to south commerce on the Mississippi River. So they understood, listen, hey, if uh, these railroad companies can build bridges across the Mississippi River, we are you know, literally and figuratively sunk as an industry here because the only thing we're basically going to have at that point is probably short haul north to south work as opposed to the big long haul stuff they were doing now. And the amount of cargo they were going to be able to move was going to shrink. The riverboat guys were not stupid. They saw what was coming and so did Abraham Lincoln. So what ends up happening is that a riverboat operator and this is documented in a, in a book called Lincoln's Greatest Trial or Lincoln's Greatest Case, which is a fascinating read, and I recommend you, you read it if this at all stirs your fancy. But effectively, one of the riverboat guys says, okay, we're going to crash into this bridge and see what happens. And they actually executed this program. A guy, crashes his, a guy crashes his riverboat into the Rock Island Bridge. The thing basically burns to the ground, and he decides he is going to sue the company that built the bridge. And the company that built the bridge picks up their fountain pen and sends Abraham Lincoln a letter and says, hey, pal, we need your help. And this would later become known as Heard versus Rock Island Bridge Company. The Rock Island Bridge Company, of course, constructed the bridge, and it was the operator of the riverboat that crashed into it that uh, brought the lawsuit. And this was a brilliantly argued case by Lincoln, and the argument, the crux of his argument was you know, if you're not able to build a bridge over a river for the advancement of your country, of its commerce, of its technology, then what are we doing here? That was kind of his argument. And he had sympathies for the steamboat operators because he loved these things. And he grew up on the river. You know, there's great stories of Abraham Lincoln on these long, you know, uh, flat boat trips that he would make as a kid. And he made money that way for a while. So he understood the plight of the steamboat operator, but Lincoln's mentality was always one of the next thing. And that's one of the most fascinating parts about his life that we don't talk a whole lot about Abraham Lincoln. Obviously, his work during the Civil War and the leadership that he provided during that horrendous time is what we all fixate on, the, his uh, abolition of slavery, the, the, the major accomplishments. But we go to Lincoln and look at him as a guy, as a, as a man, and what his personal interests were. We keep coming back to this idea that it was about technology, that it was about advancing, that it was about America having the next best thing at its disposal, being able to use and grow with it. And at this time in history, when we're talking about the mid-1850s, there was no better next best thing than the railroad and the incredible expansion of the railroad that was going on at that time. So Lincoln wins the case, and the, the, the bridge is able to stand, and had Lincoln lost that case he likely would have argued it all the way up the chain to the, to the Supreme Court. But had Lincoln lost that case, it is definitely possible that we would have seen a, a large delay in the, um, in the kind of evolution of our country, in the, in the expansion of our country. You know, in this time period, you had, uh, you know, the westerly movement of, say, Missouri-ish in that area, and then you kind of went all the way to California. There wasn't a whole lot going on in the middle there in terms of anybody living in that in that place, but it was this manifest destiny going west, and, and part of that was the expansion of the railroad. And a huge, huge deal was this particular Heard vs. Rock Island Bridge Company case, and it can be argued that Lincoln without the passion that he had for technology and without the without the passion and understanding he had of technology and its larger implications on the country might have lost this case if he tried to argue this case as a small local issue as opposed to the overriding huge issue that it brought up lincoln probably would have lost the case but he had a jury that understood his arguments and his definite vision, if you will, as to why it was important to be able to bridge rivers in order to have commerce and transportation, and he wins the case. And when we talk about this case, we can really take it all the way out to about 1863. The case that Lincoln argued was in 1857-ish, but you go all the way to 1863, and there was a case called Mississippi and Missouri Railroad Company versus Ward, and that one made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and that was finally decided by the U.S. Supreme Court that, yes, unequivocally, you can build a bridge over a waterway. Lincoln's case did not rise to the U.S. Supreme Court. It was not challenged at that point. So it was kind of, uh, if you will, accepted 
as the rule. But once it went to the Supreme Court in the form of that different case of Mississippi and Missouri Railroad Company versus Ward, and the Railroad Company won, then it became quite literally the law of the land. So Lincoln was a leader in that respect as well. The next logical place to talk about Abe Lincoln's love of technology and mechanical things is, in fact, that Civil War era. And two real examples stick out here. The first is the telegraph. And Lincoln was um, a fairly early adopter of the telegraph, and it made for a very efficient means of communication to the front lines to his generals. And instead of writing letters, you could you could immediately send a note via telegraph to your generals. And it brought on a new way of managing an army if you're the commander-in-chief. It brought on a new era of managing a war as the commander-in-chief because when you asked for a report, it didn't take a week for a letter to get where it was going and a week to get one back. It took maybe a couple hours. And if the telegraph operator had the guy right next to him, maybe it took a few minutes. So when Lincoln would challenge his generals, he would challenge McClellan, who famously was very timid and, and wouldn't attack. He always assumed that the Confederates had more soldiers than he did. He could get answers from McClellan, and he could lean pressure on him immediately as opposed to via letter, which was a more indirect method. So he adopted that telegraph. And the other thing that Lincoln really liked about the Civil War, not that he liked anything about the war, but one of the things he enjoyed during its time frame was the advancement of the weaponry used to fight the war. To the point of... He would often attend these uh, different type of test days, these type when new equipment was developed, when new weapons were developed. He would shoot them. Um, You know, when someone came and said, hey, I got this new seven-shot rifle, Abe Lincoln went out onto the White House grounds and ripped off seven rounds. Said, yeah, this thing's pretty good. He loved that type of stuff. Whether we're talking about the Parrot guns with their, you know, the rifled uh, barrels of the Parrot guns. These were all things that Abraham Lincoln, one of the earliest machine guns ever developed, was called the coffee can gun. He fired it at the White House. And, again, he didn't just take people's word for it. He, he was really fascinated by people's ability to advance technology and to do this stuff. And, again, it kind of stems stems back to this patent from May 22nd, 1849. And I know I've kind of made a big circle here, but I wanted to, I didn't want to focus just on the patent because the patent in and of itself is cool, but the fact that Lincoln saw the world in, in what I consider a very modern way when it comes to machines and technology for his time really does um, really does sum him up as a as a gearhead, as a as someone who in the modern world Abe Lincoln would have had a muscle car. Abe Lincoln would have had some cool stuff if he was around in the 60s, if he was around in, not in today's time frame. Who knows what he would be driving uh, had he, if he wasn't president, but Abe Lincoln would be a guy that would be out tinkering and doing things. He'd probably be a farmer with a humongous rock and roll John Deere tractor out there in his, in his farm, you know, tearing it up. And certainly the one loose end to really tie up here in terms of Abe Lincoln and the folks we've talked about in this particular podcast, especially a guy named Edwin Stanton, the guy who treated Lincoln roughly, the guy who Lincoln was uh, offended by and who was insulted by and who was turned away and demeaned by during that case of McCormick versus Manny. Abraham Lincoln recognized Edwin Stanton's brilliance in the courtroom. He watched Stanton work, and that was one of the inspirations he got to go home and become a much better lawyer, to go home and study hard and to go home and reevaluate the way he was trying cases so he would be capable of trying a case on the level that Stanton did and how masterfully he did during the McCormick-Manny trial. When it became time for Abraham Lincoln to appoint a cabinet to be president, this man who had offended him, this man who had demeaned him, this man who had insulted him in pretty much the most basic human ways possible was the first guy he spoke to to become his secretary of war in a country that was rapidly heading towards what would become a disastrous period in history. He understood Stanton's strengths and looked past their crummy personal relationship in order to have the nation benefit from those strengths that Stanton possessed. And while their relationship did not necessarily become very chummy in office, Stanton and Lincoln came to respect each other at an incredibly high level. Their personalities never made be never allowed them to become what we would call friends today. They certainly worked well together. They respected each other. They had their differences, but they both recognized something in each other that the other one needed that particular element of help with. Edwin Stanton was next to Abraham Lincoln the night that he died after being shot, 
by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. And he famously said, as Lincoln took his last breaths, now he belongs to the ages. Meaning that he understood how great a man Abraham Lincoln was and how he would be recognized almost in immortality in American history. So perhaps the most incredible part of this whole story isn't the fact that Lincoln was a gearhead isn't the fact that Lincoln was a lawyer that argued cases which set the path of transportation and freedom of movement in the United States, but perhaps it's the fact that Abraham Lincoln was man enough to look at somebody who he knew didn't like him, somebody he didn't like himself, and put him in one of the most important positions in one of the most trying moments in the history of this country, and they both succeeded because of it. Edwin Stanton would write many things over the course of his life after working with Abe Lincoln, Stanton was a guy who had himself a kind of mercurial personality. He was tough to get along with by any stretch, but mostly everything he wrote after Lincoln had passed away about Abraham Lincoln was incredibly positive and was incredibly informative and insightful and gives us a lot of historical window into the inner workings of the mind of Abraham Lincoln. A mind that loved farm equipment, a mind that loved technology, and a mind that loved the United States of America. And there you have it, a look back on a small little widget of history involving Abraham Lincoln, machines, and the gearhead world we live in in 2020. Everybody be safe out there. We'll be back with more Dorkomotive fun soon. Thanks for listening. This episode of the Dorkomotive podcast is being presented by Nitroactive.net. Nitroactive.net carries the best in nostalgia West Coast drag strip t-shirts as well as hot rod and car culture t-shirts from places like Moon Eyes, Laid Back, Lucky 13, SoCal Speed Shop, Hollywood Hot Rods, and more. They also have a massive inventory of vintage collectible hot rod, car craft, hop-up, popular hot rodding, drag racing, super stock, and drag illustrated magazines, as well as classic and vintage photos. Visit NitroActive.net for all your vintage hot rod and drag racing needs. Use promo code DORK and check out and save 10% on your next purchase at NitroActive.net. 